Hi, I'm Ethel Rohan, the author of the short story collection In the Event of Contact, which published on June 3rd. I'm going to read a short excerpt from a story titled F is for Something. Father Quinlan lowered the typed letter to the kitchen table. It stated Bishop Clemens himself would arrive that afternoon to hand down the priest's sentence. He'd lost count of the number of times he'd read the letter over the past week, and still he couldn't absorb it. He'd given the church 47 years of dedicated selfless service, and they planned to force him into retirement regardless. They would most likely stick him at something token and useless, and yet another parish, answering the church phone and doling out signed mass cards. Shivering, he pushed the remains of his late breakfast aside, the milk congealed at the top of his tea, like cataracts clouding a large brown eye. He excused himself. His housekeeper, Moira, didn't as much as look up from scrubbing the small saucepan at the sink and hurried out. Upstairs, he reached inside his wardrobe for his navy wool cardigan. Instead, his hand strayed to the shoulder of his once white linen suit, a remnant from his missionary stint in Nigeria 30 years back when he was young and vital. He'd never before or since wavered in his vocation, except for those few months abroad, when he couldn't convince himself those villagers needed his interference or his God. They had more than enough faith, goodness and joy in their own ways. He held the stiff white suit against his chest in the full-length mirror, startled by the gaunt, wizened face staring back from above the hanger's metal hook. Grew sliced his forehead and his cheeks looked hollowed out. The black sub layer of his hair beneath the puff of white frizz made him think of earth and bone. Inside he felt decades younger. What was that name of that village outside Lagos and its noble chief? Both names circled the edge of his mind. They would come back to him, give him a second. In the mirror, the effort to remember made his head tremble. The chief had died many years back. Father Quinlan had hoped to return to Nigeria for his funeral, the two having forged a deep friendship during their short time together, but the church wouldn't allow him to travel, citing the cost, visa paperwork and his pressing duties at home. He'd obeyed despite his disappointment and grief. Of course he had. He'd followed the archdiocese every decree without question for almost five decades. That heavy feeling came over him again, as if he were turning to concrete. He returned to the kitchen. Moira stood next to the light of the window, darning his black sock, as though it was the year 12, 1912 and not 2012. On seeing him, she snapped the line of black wool with her crooked teeth and stabbed the needle into a pin cushion. Her thick nails and sharp incisors, her height and leathery skin made him think of those enormous lizards in Nigeria, sneaky, rapid creatures measuring anywhere between five and nine feet. The red-brown of Moira's eyes also recalled the reptiles, brazen beings that still sometimes scrabbled into his dreams and hissed at him, their long forked tongues flickering. What is it you want, father? Moira's scowl made him feel like a muddy dog that had strayed into her house. Just helping myself to a mug of tea. I'll get it, father. You sit down there now and stay out of my way. She about turned and banged two saucepans together at the sink for no other reason, it seemed, than to vex him. She had to be the rowdiest woman ever let loose in a house. She clanged the copper kettle onto the enamel range. What did you do with the good china teapot? I need it for the bishop's visit today. He hitched his shoulders, feigning innocence. And where are my reading glasses? She went on. I know I left them on the windowsill. He'd had great sport in recent days, hiding things and cutting at her confidence in her faculties, just as she regularly did to him. You're awfully forgetful, father. You're confused, father. I've told you all this already, father. She fixed him with her cold eyes. I can't imagine why you'd play these games with me, father. Not you of all people. Not you of all people buzzed in his head.
He retired to the front room, the heaviness in his limbs and chest worsening, the sounds of Moira sweeping the kitchen floor carried, the needles of the broom scratching the linoleum and its head banging the base of the cabinets with relish. What if he hadn't entered the priesthood? If he'd married instead and it was his wife bustling about the kitchen? Next, she would prepare lunch, triangles of salty tomato and cucumber sandwiches and thick slices of buttered sultana cake while he settled by the warmth of the range and tackled the Indo's crossword. They would sit and eat together at the kitchen table, the harmonious quiet interrupted by the odd question, pleasant murmur and update on the children, three girls all grown. Full, content, they would take an afternoon nap his body fitted to the bony curves of her back like two halves of a whole, and their breaths a single refrain. He clapped his hand to his brow. It was no use. He only wanted the one life, and it was being taken from him. He checked the clock on the mantelpiece, the bishop's arrival drawing ever nearer. In the mirror over the fireplace, a large nerve in his cheek pulsed like a finger moving back and forth beneath his skin. He already knew he was to be banished and didn't see the point of the bishop's visit. Unless it was an opportunity to convince his lordship to grant him clemency. He resumed pacing up and down in front of the empty heart until he was seized with an idea. He would go down to the village in this, the eleventh hour, and find some good deed to perform, some hope or faith or kindness to kindle anything to prove to his parishioners and Bishop Clemens that he was still useful. Thank you so much.